Hello and good evening friends. Today is the second talk in the resident series of the ACNS webinars for the month of October. And today we are going to discuss a very important topic. The quest for the ideal treatment of a devastating disease like cerebral aneurysms has been on since many decades. Both coiling and clipping has been shown to be effective in the treatment of this disease. But the contest of superiority of one technique over the other has been on and will be continuing in the times to come. The pendulum of evidence has swung for both in favor or against each technique from time to time, depending upon the strength of the published studies. Now, we have heard the nuances of open surgical techniques from the masters in the previous edition of the ACNS webinars. But today we are going to hear the other side of the debate, that is endovascular management of cerebral aneurysms. To speak on this topic, we have a very eminent guest from uh, Japan, Professor Naoya Kuwayama. Professor Kuwayama is a professor in the Department of Neuroendovascular Therapy, Toyama University, Japan. He was the past president of the Japanese Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy. Professor Kuwayama has been a great supporter for the ACNS, especially in the educational activities for the young neurosurgeons. He has been a distinguished faculty for us in various workshops conducted across Asia. He is an avid researcher with many publications on endovascular techniques across all the leading journals in neurosurgery. To chair this session of uh, endovascular management of cerebral aneurysms, we are honored to have with us one of the most renowned faculties and senior most faculty from India in the field of endovascular surgery, Professor Anil Karapurkar. Professor Karapurkar is the head of the department, Department of Endovascular Surgery, Breach Candy Hospital, Mumbai, India. He runs one of the most sought after endovascular fellowship in the country at present. We are so fortunate to have two stalwarts of uh, neuroendovascular surgery for us today for this webinars. On behalf of the education committee of the ACNS and the president of Suyuko Kato, I hereby welcome today's speaker, Professor Naoya Kuwayama and the chair, Professor Anil Karapurkar, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co host for today. And with that introduction, may I please hand over the platform to Professor Karapurkar. Thank you, Professor Raja. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this teaching seminar on endovascular treatment of uh, aneurysms. I belong to the old generation where we were only treating aneurysms with detachable balloons. When I first heard Guido Guglielmi talking about platinum coils, I thought this is never going to be practical. I had heard him in 1987 at a meeting in Verona. And I never thought $40, $40 per centimeter of coil will never be economical. But lo and behold, within four years of that, it was being used and tried out in experimental situations. In 1996, the coils were approved by the US FDA, after which it was, uh, we were all trained in how to use these coils. And then there was a plethora of cases all across the world. Initially, we were only treating giant and large inoperable, inoperable aneurysms. Gradually, as things got better and better, the materials got better and better, we started treating smaller coils and uh, smaller aneurysms. And after uh, the ISET, landmark ISET study, uh, there has been an explosion of uh, cases being treated by the endovascular route all across the world. It was difficult. It had been a tough battle between the radiologists and the clinicians. But I think uh, eventually, uh, it will eventually go, go, go down to the expertise of your center and your uh, uh, wherewithal, whatever you have available to you. So we started with giant aneurysms, then we came down to smaller aneurysm with a single balloon, then double balloon, then a single stand, then a double stand, then flow diverters, and now intrasacular devices. I'm sure Professor Kuwayama is going to take us across the whole spectrum and show us some wonderful cases. So over to Professor Kuwayama for his talk on the endovascular treatment of aneurysms. Okay, thank you very much for introducing me. Okay, let's start. So for tonight, I will talk about endovascular management of several aneurysms. And I'm uh, Dr. Kuwayama uh, from Toyama, Japan. I'd be very happy to be with you in this uh, kind of uh, 
ACNU, ACNS uh, webinar tonight. So, uh, do you know who he is? He's uh, Professor Egas Monitz. He's the man who did this uh, diagnostic cerebral angiography first in the world. It was 1927, maybe um, almost 100 years ago. And he also was a Minister of Foreign Affairs and he got the Nobel Prize by frontal lobotomy, not from cerebral angiography. He should have gotten a Nobel Prize by cerebral angiography, I think. But at that time, he got Nobel Prize by lobotomy. Lobotomy is a very interesting uh, operation at that time. But nowadays, we do not anymore. We do not anymore. There was a big paradigm shift in the field of neuroendovascular treatment. Uh, one paradigm, uh, one paradigm shift is the GDC development in 1991, about uh, 30 years ago. This is the beginning of the uh, aneurysm coil treatment. The second paradigm shift is the ISAT trial publishment. It was 2002. Uh, from this uh, paper, uh, the ruptured aneurysm is started to uh, be treated by uh, coil treatment. And this is a movie in my uh, university hospital. I usually use this uh, Zigo robotic arm and geography machine like this. And uh, this machine is setting, uh, set it in a hybrid operation room. We can do uh, neuroendovascular treatment as well as uh, open surgery in this room. So uh, before talking about uh, aneurysm coil, uh, I should uh, start with the indication and uh, introduction of uh, adjunctive technique to you. So what is the good aneurysm for coiling? Of course, uh, small neck aneurysm is very suitable for coil treatment. And if it's a wide neck aneurysm, the treatment uh, is a little bit difficult, but we can still treat the patient with this uh, a variety of devices at present. How about size? A uh, very nice size for coiling is from five millimeter to 15 millimeter in diameter. Smaller one or larger one is not so good candidate for coiling. Especially a very small aneurysm like this, uh, less than three millimeter is very dangerous aneurysm for treatment of coil. And uh, at present, we have variety of adjunctive uh, techniques like uh, wire assist, catheter assist, balloon assist, and double catheter technique, and uh, balloon plus double catheter technique, stent, of course, stent assist. And because we're neurosurgeon, we can do surgery assist technique. This is double catheter technique. Uh, we, we usually use two uh, micro catheter in the aneurysm dome. And this is balloon assist technique or balloon, balloon remodeling technique. And this is a stent assist technique, of course. So before talking about the coil treatment, uh, I should talk about antiplatelet therapy for the uh, patient in the field of neuroendovascular treatment. Monitor of the uh, platelet aggregation is very, very important. A dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, so-called DAPT, D-A-P-T, DAPT, with the aspirin and clopidogrel is essential neuroendovascular treatment to prevent thromboembolic complications. Uh, the uh, agent should be given one or two weeks before treatment, but there are some uh, percentage of non or hypo responder to aspirin or clopidogrel 
the number of known hyperresponder is about 10% for aspirin and 25% for clopidogrel. So uh, we should identify these kind of patients before treatment, before treatment. And uh, at present, we have a very nice machine called Verify Now, which is very small and simple device. And we can know the uh, uh, platelet aggregation function maybe uh, within 10 minutes by blood sampling. And uh, you can see PLU for clobidogrel and ALU for aspirin. What is the uh, optimal PLU level? PLU level for clopidogrel. If it's under 60 here, if it's under 60 here, the, it's called hyperresponder, hyperresponder. And then you will have some hemorrhagic complication after treatment. And if it's uh, uh, over more than 240, this is so-called poor or non-responder. You may have some uh, ischemic complications during or after treatment. So the optimal level of PLU is in between 60 to 240. And in case with the uh, ALU for aspirin, uh, it should be less than 550, 550. So the timing is also is very uh, important the uh, start of the antiplatelet therapy. If it's uh, unruptured aneurysms, uh, dual agent should be given one or two weeks before treatment. And if it's for ruptured, if it's a ruptured aneurysms, a single, single, usually aspirin, single antiplatelet therapy, if simple coding, and dual agent, if stents are used, should be given during or immediately after treatment as loading doses as aspirin 325 milligram and clopidogrel 300 milligram. Then let's talk about unreason coiling technique. So we have to prepare the coiling before start coiling. Uh, as I told, as I told you before, dual antiplatelet therapy DAPT should be given one or two prior to treatment, one or two weeks prior to treatment. And uh, general anesthesia is recommended in order to immobilize the patient during treatment. And the biplane angio machine is, of course, uh, better than single arm. And at least uh, we need six French or larger guiding catheters for treatment. And uh, several lines should be prepared, like a coil line or balloon line or stand line. Uh, this is an example of one day. You can see bilateral femoral approach. And uh, also you can see three micro catheters, one, two, three. Maybe this is a setting for a double catheter and balloon assist technique. Of course, we have uh, hundreds kinds of uh, platinum detachable coil at present. Uh, you can see uh, hard coil, very soft coil. You can see variety of uh, coil shape like this or like this with a variety of detachment mechanisms like electro-detach, mechanical detach, or hydraulic detachment. Uh, let's start with a simple coiling. Uh, you can see ICP command reason here. This is ICA and this is PCOM and this is PCA. Uh, this clip is in the opposite side. So you can see aneurysm neck right here. It's a very small neck. So this is a very good candidate for coiling. You can see balloon catheter here. 
and I'm sending one microcatheter to the dome and the second microcatheter to the dome. So this is a setting of the uh, double catheter and balloon assist technique, but in this very nice aneurysm, I used only one microcatheter, only one microcatheter as a simple technique. You can see very nice flaming coil, framing coil in the aneurysm dome. I do not use any balloon, I do not any second catheter. So one simple catheter can treat this kind of patients. Very nice framing coil. And I start feeling, this is a final feeding coil. You can see very dense packing of the uh, arteries. A final DSA. It's a simple coiling technique. And uh, I will show you very uh, interesting case uh, with a very, very small ruptured aneurysm. It's also uh, treated by simple coiling, but uh, you can see very small, very tiny aneurysm arising from the origin of pica. This is vertebral artery, this is pica. And can you see this very small, tiny aneurysm? The size of aneurysm is one by two millimeter. This is ruptured aneurysm rupture. And this is a kind of a very high risk aneurysm for coiling. Very tiny, very tiny aneurysm. At first, I go with the balloon catheter for in case of rupture, I will, de I will uh, inflate the, this balloon for hemostasis. And the second catheter is going into the distal pica like here. And finally, the, uh, the catheter is going into the aneurysm suck. But you can see the tip of the microcatheter, that this is a tip of the microcatheter. And uh, you, you cannot see any uh, aneurysm dome. The size of the microcatheter and the dome is uh, same very uh, risky situation. The tip of the catheter and the, you, you can see coiling coming out of the microcatheter, but the coiling is, is very unstable. The size of this coil is one millimeter by two centimeter length. Very small coil, but the, uh, the coil is very unstable. Sometimes it kick back to the parent vertebral artery. Like this. So the combination moving movement of the uh, microcatheter and coil is essential in this uh, kind of a situation. Again, the coil is getting out of the uh, aneurysm dome. Then I restarted coiling. This is a third trial. And I push coil very, very slowly and very softly into the aneurysm dome and push the microcatheter towards the uh, aneurysm. And finally, I made a coiling in the dome of the uh, aneurysms. Then detach. So this is a final view. You can see how difficult and how risky to treat this kind of a very small, tiny aneurysm with coiling. The next is the catheter assist technique. You can see a large aneurysm arising from vertebral artery, but also you can see pica coming out of the aneurysm dome. So how can you treat this kind of treatment, this kind of uh, aneurysm? When you put coil, the coil will block the orifice of the pica. You have to preserve the orifice of the pica. 
how can you do it? So my idea is to send the coil from the contralateral left vertebral artery to the uh, ipsilateral distal pica, like, like this, in cord line from the uh, right vertebral, making coil frame, and remove catheter. See, this is a coil, uh, no, uh, catheter as this technique. Okay, I will show you the case. Left vertebral artery, right vertebral artery. So I used bilateral femoral approach. And micro line from the left vertebral artery then the uh, microcatheter is going to the ipsilateral uh, right side vertebral artery and finally going into the distal pica like this, guide wire into the distal pica and catheter is going distal side of the pica. Then I made uh, catheter assist by this line, by this line. And the cord line from the right vertebral and start making a framing coil. You can see the framing coil is blocked by this uh, catheter coming from the uh, left side vertebral artery. You can see the uh, orifice of the pica is well preserved by this microcatheter. Okay, so this is a nice framing coil. And after this uh, framing coil, I can use a piecemeal technique. A piecemeal technique is to send the very small, very soft, small uh, uh, coil into the, uh, into the uh, aneurysm dome within the, this uh, framing coil, piece by piece, a very small coil, piece by piece. This is a piecemeal technique. See, the framing coil does not move by the uh, second or third or fourth uh, coil. Maybe final coil. Okay, you can see the dome is well packed and the piker is still uh, alive. The orifice of the piker is well preserved. Okay, so uh, the second case, the uh, catheter technique, uh, catheter assist technique. You can see a uh, small aneurysm arising from also pica this is a ruptured pica aneurysm, ruptured one. Very small, maybe three millimeter in diameter. And I send the microcatheter into the aneurysm dome like this. This is a dome of the aneurysm. Now catheter tip is in the center of the dome. This is a distal pica, and I send the second catheter to the distal pica. And my aim is to block uh, coil movement by this uh, assist catheter. I start making a frame coil. You can see the coil is moving within the aneurysm dome, never get back into the parent pica. You can see the very nice framing coil. This is a barrel view, barrel on, on the barrel view. 
This is pica orifice, and this is coil, and this is vertebral artery. Then I start fitting the aneurysm within the framing coil. Very slowly and very softly. You can see the orifice of the pica is well preserved. Remove the uh, cyst catheter and remove the coil catheter. This is a final view. Okay, so let's talk about balloon assist technique. Uh, this is a very, very uh, common technique. You can see I see PCOM aneurysm here. This is ICA, this is PCOM, postural communicating artery, and this is PCA. And the aneurysm is very, very white neck, white neck. How can you protect the uh, ICA or PCOM from coil? This is balloon catheter, the distal ICA, and coil catheter into the dome. And start making a frame, but you can see the coil is hernating into the parent internal carotid artery. And then I inflate the balloon and you can see the movement of the coil here. The coil is well making a very nice framing coil within the sac of the aneurysm. After deflation of the balloon, the coil does not move. Then, during balloon inflation, I put uh, some other coils into the uh, framing coil. Also very slowly and very softly. Maybe this is a final, you can see balloon inflated in the uh, parent ICA here. Okay, maybe that is a final coil. This is a final DSA. You can see well-preserved posterior, uh, posterior uh, communicating artery. This is the case with the uh, uh, MCA bifurcation aneurysm. You can see M1 portion here and the M2 branch, major branch, and this is a minor M2 branch. And you can see aneurysm here, just 4.6 millimeter in diameter. My first plan to, uh, to use a simple coiling. You can see this uh, framing catheter, uh, framing coil is uh, uh, just a little bit bigger. Uh, it's blocking this uh, major M2 branch. So I should try second one. This is a second trial of framing coil. This is worse. This uh, framing coil blocks the, this uh, minor M2 branch. This is a third trial, third trial. Still not good, blocking this uh, minor M2 branch. So I decided to use balloon catheter. I send a balloon catheter to the distal M2 branches like this, I inflate balloon and start coiling again. You can see a framing coil is getting smaller and getting better, much better, much better. After that, during inflation of the balloon, I can put the uh, uh, fitting coil into the uh, aneurysm dome. Okay. So I will show you a balloon plus double catheter technique.
you can see aneurysm here and a very, very large PCOM, posterior communicating artery, arising from the uh, aneurysm dome. How can you treat this kind of uh, aneurysm? Aneurysm here, here aneurysm, PCOM and a PCA. Aneurysm here, balloon catheter in the distal ICA and uh, double catheter first catheter and the second catheter. And uh, start coiling in the aneurysm dome. This is the first framing, first trial. It's like a, a little bit herniating into the uh, PCOM site. So I decided to try again. This is a second trial. Okay, second trial. You can see this. Uh, two or three loops uh, block the uh, orifice of the posterior communicating artery. So the third trial also block the uh, posterior communicating artery. Then I inflate the balloon in front of the uh, aneurysm dome, neck, and start it again. You can see smaller framing coil nicely preserved posterior communicating artery line. Rotation, rotation fluoroscopy, you can see clearly. Then the posterior communicating artery is well preserved by a balloon and double catheter technique. Okay, uh, as a summary, uh, balloon assist technique uh, avoid uh, coil getting out of the aneurysm sac. Uh, it can keep coils within the aneurysm dome. And it makes a good frame by herniating into the sac and also sparing branches arising from aneurysm neck. And uh, balloon can help catheters stay in aneurysm sac avoiding catheter kickback. And finally, the balloon get hemostasis in case of rupture. So, we can go to stent assist technique. At present, uh, we have two kinds of stent. One is laser cut stent and the other is a braided stent. And uh, in laser cut stent, uh, we have two kinds of laser cut stents in Japan. One is Enterprise 2 coming from Johnson & Johnson and the other is Neuroform Atlas stent coming from uh, Stryker. And uh, Enterprise stent is, uh, you can see, closed cell, closed cell stent and the atlas stent is an open cell. You can see open cell, you open cell stents. And the behavior of these stents are a little bit different. You can see uh, VA pica aneurysm here, about seven millimeter in diameter. But the pica arising from the neck portion of the aneurysm. So, we have to uh, spare the orifice of the pica. And I decided to use stent in the pica to the uh, proximal vertebral artery. This is a, a stent line going into the distal pica and the coil line here in the dome of the aneurysm. And I made a framing coil in the aneurysm dome 
that this framing coil blocks the orifice of the pie car. Here, this is an orifice of the pie car, a blocked by a coil. And then, this is a rotation fluoroscopy. Then I sent the stent into the uh, distal PCA and open up from pica to proximal BA. You can see the uh, orifice of the pica very clearly here. Here is the uh, orifice of the pica. And after that, I can push a uh, feeding coil into the aneurysm dome. Very simple. Maybe final coil. This is a final view. You can see very clearly the orifice of the piker in the orifice of the uh, aneurysm dome, aneurysm nick. So this is the, uh, another case, ICA paraclinoid aneurysm arising uh, from here. The uh, diameter of the uh, aneurysm is about three to four millimeter. My uh, first plan is to use balloon assist technique. I'm sorry. Okay, my first plan is to use balloon assist technique. Balloon catheter into the distal ICA and cord line to the dome of the uh, aneurysm. Start flaming coil, start making a framing coil. Balloon here. But the loop is herniating into the parent ICA, so I remake it. This time, this is a nice framing coil. And then I put the coil, fitting coil, into the aneurysm dome like this. Feeding, feeding the dome like this. This is a final coil. Then this is a rotation fluoroscopy. You can see the dome of the aneurysm and the orifice of the aneurysm. And after inflating the balloon, I pull the coil line, pull the coil line. But you can see here, after deflation of the balloon, the coil, the tail of the coil, ah, came back to the parent ICA. You can see the tail of the coil here in the floating in the ICA. So I decided to use rescue stenting. Rescue stenting. I push, send a coil, another coil into the distal ICA and open up the stent open up the stand from the distal to the proximal ICA. You can see here, the coil is pushing to the wall of the ICA. So the tail is fixed in the wall of the ICA. This is a rescue stand technique. Okay, the next talk is a braided stance. Uh, you can see how different these coils are. These are braided stent, uh, so-called Elvis Jr., Elvis Blue, and this is a laser cut stent. And the characteristic movement of this uh, braided stent is uh, herniation in towards the next side of the aneurysm. You can see herniation of the mesh braided stents into the neck, towards the neck of the aneurysm, like this. And this is a case with the uh, basal tip aneurysm. Sending a, a balloon catheter, the distal PCA, and this is a cord line. And uh, start with the two or three loops of coil and start deploying the stand from the distal part of the PCA 
to this is the neck of the aneurysm. Then I push the catheter and stent like this. Push stent and catheter like this to herniate the stent mesh towards the aneurysm neck. You can see the stent is herniating towards the neck of the aneurysm. And keep pushing framing coil into the uh, aneurysm dome. This is like a hunting, hunting hat, hunting cap. Very wide, very wide neck aneurysm. And the height is very small. Rotation, you can see how wide how wide the, uh, the aneurysm neck. And I push the uh, feeding coil into the dome. Okay, this is a final view. It's a complete occlusion of the aneurysm. I, I will never be, be able to uh, treat this kind of uh, uh, patient without any stent. And this uh, braided stent. This is a uh, vertebral artery fusiform anery aneurysm here. Maybe dissecting aneurysm. You can see pica here. Aneurysm here. There is some uh, indentation in the pr uh, proximal neck of the uh, aneurysm. And I send the uh, elbis uh, stent into the distal basal artery, and this is a cord line. And start to deploy stent from the distal vertebral artery to the proximal portion, and start flaming. And this is no good. This is no good. And uh, I open up again. And this framing is better, better than before. Then I push some uh, filling coil into the uh, uh, dissecting part. Okay, this is a final view. You can see the very nice fitting of the aneurysm. And this is a Ricard aneurysm arising from the uh, ICA, ICA, uh, supraclinoid portion. You can see the coil. This is uh, Ricard aneurysm and uh, you can see coil in the tip of the aneurysm. And the patient was referred to me. You can see very wide neck and the very uh, small coil here. And I decided to use LB stent in the ICA to treat this uh, patient. Coils in the tip of the uh, aneurysm, sending uh, stent catheter to the distal MCA and cord line. This is cord line into the dome. And send uh, LB stent, start deploying the LB stent from the distal part of the ICA. Just up to here. You can see a half gelled uh, stent here. And the, uh, I like half gelling technique because uh, there is some uh, place for the uh, uh, microcatheter to move freely in the proximal part of the uh, parent artery. So uh, half gel technique is very, uh, very good to uh, mobilize the uh, microcatheter. So start framing coil. It's a nice, nice frame. 
and feeding coil. All right. And then I open up the stent at this timing, at this timing. You can see nicely placed LB stent and a nicely packed aneurysm here. Uh, this case is uh, uh, also dissecting vertebral artery aneurysm. You can see aneurysm here, uh, vertebral artery, small vertebral artery here, and pica. And I, this case is also treated by uh, LB stent. And I'm sending a uh, stent line into the uh, distal basilar artery, but there is some uh, stenotic part here, so the uh, catheter is kicking. And finally, get into the uh, distal, distal part. And uh, this is a cord line. And I start two or three loops of coiling and then stent will be open from here to here. Also half gel technique. You can see stent is placed from here to here and coiling here. And in this situation, I start uh, making a framing coil. Okay. You can see open vertebral artery here. This is a barrel view, barrel view. And this is a final, final DSA. The vertebral artery is well preserved. Then let's go to the surgery assisted technique. This is a Ricard ICA aneurysm. Because the patient has a very bad anatomy in the aortic arch, uh, we uh, could not get into the uh, patient carotid artery from the femoral line. So we decided to dissect patient neck, uh, direct uh, carotid puncture, neck dissection. Or you can see uh, this is a puncture of the common carotid artery. You can see uh, skin tunnel here. Skin tunnel is very important to uh, stabilize the uh, uh, catheter. And this is common carotid. So guiding sheath is getting into the uh, common carotid artery. Like this. and setting up the guiding sheath. After this, the treatment is going as usual. This is aneurysm, packed coil, Ricard aneurysm. I go with the stent line to the distal ICA and the coil line here in the dome of the aneurysm and coiling coiling in the dawn and the uh, stent is going into the distal part and uh, open up, open up the stent and uh, embolize the uh, rest of the aneurysm. This is final view. So open surgery, open dissecting the neck is a very, very important technique for us neurosurgeon. We can do it very easily. So, uh, next is flow diverter. Uh, uh, the uh, indication of flow diverter in Japan 
is very restricted. Uh, it, can, it can be used only in ICA or vertebral artery, and the uh, aneurysm size should be five millimeter or larger. And uh, the aneurysm should be unruptured. Ruptured aneurysm is not an indication of a flow diverter in Japan. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, this is a case with the giant aneurysm uh, arising from the cavernous portion of the ICA. And this is immediately after uh, deploying the uh, pipeline in the parent uh, internal carotid artery. You can see eclipse sign, eclipse sign here. Eclipse, eclipse sign means uh, the uh, contrast media is uh, floating in the uh, bottom of the uh, aneurysm. And this is uh, DSA uh, after one year. The aneurysm is gone. And this is pipeline. Another case, very huge aneurysm uh, causes a patient diplopy. And also I dissect the neck because of the uh, bad uh, anatomy of the aortic arch. This is the same, neck dissection, common carotid artery, insertion of the guiding sheath and approach. You can see microcatheter here, and uh, this is uh, a tip of the uh, distal access catheter. In the pipeline treatment, uh, microcatheter and distal access catheter, these catheters combination movement is very important to open up the uh, pipeline. Otherwise, you cannot open the pipeline. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to open the pipeline. The pipeline is opening here. This is a tip of the microcatheter. And Okay, I'm doing balloon stent plasty, balloon stent plasty to get the uh, uh, very tight opposition of the stent and the vessel wall. This is a very essential technique when you do a pipeline flow diverter treatment. And this is final view. You can see stent from here up to here. Final view, you also see, can see a uh, eclipse sign. And this is four months later, and this is a DSA one year later. The aneurysm is gone. So this is a treatment which uh, I treated uh, last week. Uh, this is a ruptured aneurysm. In Japan, ruptured aneurysm is not the indication of flow diverter. So I have to do coding for this patient at first. <clears throat> Sending two catheters into the uh, aneurysm dome, and my uh, balloon catheter in the distal ICA. So this is a, a balloon and double catheter technique, making framing coil in the dome of the aneurysm and fitting the coil in the dome. Okay, and this is a final view of the uh, treatment. Final view of the treatment. But uh, the coil will get compacted very, very soon. Therefore, the patient should be treated with flow diverter in the chronic stage under uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, for this patient, I planned to treat uh, this patient by flow diverta two weeks later. So I will show you finally a very interesting case. It's a cervical ICA aneurysm. The patient uh, had a heart surgery at, at birth. It's a, uh, I have heard from her, it's a fontan surgery. Uh, it's a heart, heart surgery. And uh, he noticed gradually growing, pulsating retropharyngeal mass. 
and this is a mass. Now, our diagnosis is a very giant aneurysm arising from the cervical uh, ICA. The uh, diameter, maximum diameter of the aneurysm is five centimeters. And I decided to use covered stent for, to, for the treatment of this patient. Covered stent means two bare nitinol stents and uh, PTFE. PTFE is the uh, uh, artificial uh, vessel wall. You can see white vessel wall here. This is a PTFE. And the treatment is very simple and very fast. You can see guiding catheter here. I send the uh, stent catheter here and deploy and start deploy this covered stent from here. And gradually the stent is opening. It's completely deployed. That's it. That's it. The treatment is very simple, very simple. You can see no more aneurysm here. And this is before treatment, and this is uh, one week later. One week later, the mass uh, is shrinking uh, day by day after treatment. Okay, uh, the coiling presentation uh, is finished. Uh, in the final stage, let me talk about ACNU uh, hands on workshop. Uh, this is a photo example uh, of uh, ACNS, ACNS uh, neuroendovascular hands on workshop. Uh, this is a, a young one case last year. This is a, a aneurysm coiling uh, training device. This is a silicone vessel. And this is a clot retrieval thrombectomy uh, training device. Uh, we have been holding 10 to 12 hands-on workshop for uh, SNS. And maybe we can see you, we can see you next year after COVID-19. So I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Koyama, for a very illustrated, very well illustrated talk on treatment of aneurysms. Uh, may I say some things uh, which are relevant to us in India? So the double antiplatelet, which we have started with, um, in India, the incidence of resistance to antiplatelets is very high. And we have been using uh, Verify now, but we have found Verify now to be unreliable. We've had many false negatives where we think it is patient is a responder and yet he is not a responder and we have stent thrombosis. So now we rely more and more on direct platelet aggregation test which our pathology uh, laboratory is doing for us. So we so they actually see the clot retraction time and see how much the antiplatelet su suppression is with them. So we, if we find that the antiplatelet suppression is not adequate, have to double the dose. And whenever we use a flow diverter, instead of using Plavix, because the incidence is very high you know, of uh, resistance to the Plavix, we use uh, ticagrelor, the, sh the short-acting... Uh, uh, ticagrelor, I yes, see. Yes. So we use a smaller dose of aspirin. We use 75 milligrams of aspirin. And we use 90 milligrams twice daily of ticagrelor in a, in a mm -hmm. good patient, or maybe 60 milligrams. Uh, we have found... I don't know whether you have the pipeline shield available. With the pipeline... Pipeline yeah, yes. of course we have it. Yeah. So there we can reduce the dose of uh, uh, and mm -hmm. we give 60 milligrams when we are using uh, the pipeline uh, sheet. Mm -hmm. Or uh, can you use uh, uh, press grail? Press grail? Yes, in fact, when you, apply, 
Mm. Yes, my, many of my colleagues uh, like to use Prasugrel, but I'm not very happy using Prasugrel, and most of us in Western India use uh, <laughs> Ticagrelor. But okay. in South India, Dr. Santosh Joseph, who has a huge number of cases, <coughs> and also in the north, and in Delhi, yeah. the two or three guys who do large numbers, they all use Prasugrel. Mm -hmm. But in, West, so Western in Japan, India, yes. Uh, in Japan, Ticagrelor is not available. Unfortunately, so uh, we can use Prasgura instead of uh, uh, clopidogrel for the uh, uh, clopidogrel hypo or non-responder. Okay. The percentage of the uh, no hypo responder of, to the uh, uh, to that agent is very small in number. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second thing I wanted to say was uh, when we are doing simple coiling. Usually, we do not use empty platelet. Hmm? I'm you sorry. When we are doing simple coiling, we do simple not use coiling? yes, we do not use any anti platelet. Anti -platelet. We prefer, yeah, I we use, don't use only one only one anti platelet. Yes, but we As prefer one Okay. And for At how least long do one you? One agent will be needed. For how long do you use it? Maybe three months. Three. Hmm. We have not been using for simple coiling. We have been using only when we have, we think that we will need to use uh, the mm -hmm. uh, okay. stent. Yes. Mm. Uh, you showed a very nice technique of uh, getting the stent to herniate, the braided yeah. stent to herniate into the neck of the aneurysm. Uh -huh. I think That's that is a very a, nice uh, technique. Yeah. That, that is a very nice technique, I think. Mm -hmm. So for those of us who are young and who are starting, I think uh, this is a very nice technique to follow. Mm -hmm. And uh, you showed a very nice case of covered stent. This covered stent uh, that you have shown is a self-expanding covered stent. Yes. But, uh, but you also get balloon-mounted covered stents. And those can be used in the cervical ICA fairly easily. Uh, but it's very it dangerous to, to use the yes. uh, balloon expandable uh, covered stents. Yes. Uh, uh, now I, they are available, but I, I don't is, like it. <laughs> Fifteen uh, years ago, we didn't have some self-expanding covered stents. It has some risk to uh, yeah. damage the uh, parent artery by yes. balloon inflating. Yes. yes. Mm. Have you so done any self-expanding stent? Is very safe. Yeah, it is. It is no question. Yeah. Mm. Have you used any any uh, Y stenting or X stenting, as they say? Oh yes, yes. Y stenting in the uh, basal tip aneurysm and X stenting in the ACOM aneurysm. X stent is uh, from A1, uh, from A2 to A1, and uh, another stent in the uh, uh, opposite side, A2 and the ipsilateral A1 segment. Left A1 to left A2 and right A1 to right A2. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Left A1 to right A1 and uh, left mm. A1 to mm. A2 and right A1. Right, right. Like uh, uh, yeah. but uh, uh, sometimes it uh, it's associated with uh, uh, thromboembolic complication. Oh, so we yeah. have to be very careful about it. Yeah. Yeah. We sometimes do use we in India do use. Uh, I'm sure in many other countries in the Asia Pacific area also, uh, we do use the stent in the acute the flow diverter in the acute situation. Mm -hmm. In that case, uh, there are some who prime the patient by giving ticagrelor or or prasugrel and aspirin a few hours before we start. The advantage of ticagrelor is it acts within two hours. So we can just give it during induction. And oh, is it? it? Acts, yes. That's ah. the advantage of ticagrelor. It acts very fast. Ah, it's very nice. So, so you can give it during induction. And uh, by the time your, you deploy the stent, it has acted. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, uh, yeah. So OK, thank so, you very much. Some people use the ticagrelor, uh, I mean, they prime the patient. Mm -hmm. Some people don't prime the patient. They put a rice tube. Through the rice tube, they give the uh, aspirin and the ticagrelor or whatever. And they also use GP2B3A inhibitors, a small dose. Uh, Have you had GP3A. ever? Uh, yes. we, also, we, uh, we don't yes. have it in Japan. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately. So, mm. so sometimes but, we, have, uh, we have done that. We can, we can use it intra-arterial use it, right? Yes, yes. 
Yes, mm. we give it arterial in injection. Yeah. A bolus is given intra-arterial and then it can be given as an intravenous infusion over the next six hours. Mm -hmm. If there is a thrombus formation inside. I think it is, we it uh, is, absolutely need it. <laughs> it is very effective when there is a thrombus inside us. Yep. Yes, I know, I know, but uh, it's not available. Oh, oh. So how do you... Unbelievable. How do you, how do you manage then if a patient gets a thrombus inside a stent? Uh, we can use uh, some kind of uh, antiplatelet uh, intravenous injection. Aspirin Maybe is the only it one. It will not be available in uh, foreign country, only in Japan. Aspirin is the only intravenous antiplatelet. No, we have no aspirin in injection. I aspirin is know. only for oral intake. I think in Australia, they have uh, aspirin injection. Somebody I see. can correct me if I'm mistaken. So I the think drug, can... drug circumstances is very bad in Japan. Yeah, I know. Your, mm. your MDA I... is probably even stronger than the... The US government MDA. is very strict. <laughs> so your, 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 your Japanese MDA is very, very strict. Mm. I know because I, I have been interacting with uh, uh, the senior Japanese... Uh, intervention is for many years. Yeah, your, your situation is very tough. Yeah. Okay. But but on the other hand, once you get your, uh, there is no limit to what you can do. That's very good. So uh, you've shown some wonderful cases. I think Thank now you. we'll, we'll can we throw the uh, floor open for questions? Uh, I would like to open the topic for discussion with the audiences. May I call upon Thank you, Professor Kuwayama, uh, to a great lecture. Uh, can I have one question for uh, your topic? Uh, do you have any recommend for the follow-up imaging after you did a pro-diverter stent, chart test, or MRI, or angiography, Professor? Okay, okay. It's a nice question. Uh, in in cases of flow diverter, I will follow the, the uh, patient every three months by MRI, especially a uh, TOF, time of flight image is, is very nice to follow the patient. And if I uh, do not any blood in the aneurysm dome, I will do a diagnostic angiography, maybe uh, one year later, one year later. Mm -hmm. And yeah, do you yeah. have some problem about the the uh, the not clear imaging for TOF uh, for from the stent interfere about the signal of the aneurysm will uh, is uh, obliterated or not? Because in in some time it's really difficult to interpret by MIA because mm -hmm. the the scatter do of the stent. Do you use TOF image? Yes, yes, TOF. We can see very clearly uh, intra-animal ah. uh, blood flow in the uh, image of TOF. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank mm -hmm. you, Professor. May I add something? Okay. Yeah, please. For a giant aneurysm, one must do an MRE because you may not see what is happening inside on the MRE, but what is happening outside, you don't see on a DSA. So in a giant aneurysm, one must do both. You, one must do a, a DSA as well as an MRI until one can see the aneurysm shrinking. Because sometimes the aneurysm may grow. Oh, so yes, you, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So usually when we do a giant aneurysm and we use a flow diverter, we give the patient anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, diclofenac as a patch, and we give steroids for about a week or so for a giant aneurysm where there is going to be a large thrombus load, we give uh, steroids and anti-inflammatory for about two months. And of course, follow up on MRI and DSA both. Yeah, thank you for those nice comments. Uh, about this giant aneurysms, I would just like to ask uh, both the chair as well as the speaker, Professor Kuyama, is that uh, these giant aneurysms uh, grow and they develop their own blood supply on the walls of these aneurysms and they often bleed into these cavities and uh, re-bleed also. That is why we have different stages of blood uh, when you uh, take an MRI for these giant aneurysms. 
So the ideal strategy is, of course, to exclude these aneurysms from the circulation by a bypass or a flow diverter. So what is your failure rate for giant aneurysms? Have you observed in your place? In the failure case? The failure rates of giant aneurysms. Where okay. We, we will do high flow uh, bypass surgery and uh, aneurysm. Exclude the aneurysm. Yeah, trapping. Trapping. Mm. This is a, a very nice technique. Yeah. But uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult. Not so easy. Yeah. High flow bypass and the trapping. Yeah. Especially in the posterior fossa, you have to do a, a, a bypass surgery from the STA or from the OA to the PCA or SCA or PICA. That's a very complicated uh, surgical technique. Yeah, it is. But, the sit but if the situation is very bad, we have to do, still, we have to do that kind of surgery. Flow yeah, diverter is not a dream device. I understand. Partially thrombosed giant aneurysm. We don't know the result. Yeah. What so about where, where yeah. artery occlusion, we are doing less and less now, since we have got the flow diverter. And as I said, since we have added uh, steroids and anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, failure rate is very low. Uh, in fact, I've just we've just done a follow-up angiogram on a patient. So what happens in these patients is, if the aneurysm has not completely thrombosed that, say nine months, we stop, or even six months, we stop one antiplatelet. We just continue with aspirin. And we yeah. often find that it progresses to complete thrombosis. I see. And your question about the enlargement of the aneurysm, that is the problem. That is why we give steroids, because the vaza vasora and the vasogenic growth factors come into play when there is a large thrombosis flow, which happens when there is an acute closure of a giant aneurysm. In a partially thrombosed aneurysm, also it happens, but it is seen much more when a large, like for instance, the, the cavernous aneurysm that he showed was a huge aneurysm. So here, in such a patient, we would use uh, antiplatelet. It doesn't happen always, of course. It is very uncommon. But sometimes, in fact, I remember from Japan only, uh, who was that? One of your colleagues from Nagoya had shown a patient where the patient was bleeding repeatedly. This was about 25 years ago. The, the patient was bleeding repeatedly from a giant aneurysm in which there was no flow on the angiogram. The aneurysm mm -hmm. was not seen, but the aneurysm was still enlarging and still bleeding. So, in fact, we started using the steroids and anti inflammatory drugs after that, after that mm -hmm. uh, presentation. Right. It's Thank a kind much. of a vasa vasorum, yeah. Yeah, uh, feeding yeah. artery from the another vessel to the aneurysm wall. Right. Yes, my friend, Liu. Uh, thank you for, again, a very comprehensive and a good flow. Hi, Liu. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, your from, help. Uh, Always. Yeah. yeah. I, and uh, I, I want to ask your opinion. Uh, for a clipper, uh, they said the aim of the uh, surgery is to restore, rest, restore the configuration of the vessel to the pre-aneurysm state. So, what is your opinion regarding uh, uh, em uh, I mean embolization or coiling method uh, to achieve that restoration of the configuration of vessel to the pre aneurysm state? The uh, end of the coiling yeah. is to get the uh, inner side of the inner membrane, that's the final uh, cure of the aneurysm. Mm -hmm. In the case, with, uh, in the case treated with a coil, but uh, mm -hmm. sometimes it's very difficult to get in the layer of the uh, vessel wall, mm -hmm. and at that time, at that case, uh, the aneurysm will recur. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So if yes. the endothelium, if the aneurysm gets endothelialized, the endothelium mm -hmm. grows across the neck mm -hmm. of the aneurysm. Then, in fact, many times you can see a gap between the wall of the artery and the coil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is a membrane which is seen. So ideally, that is what we want. Okay. And that is what that is what happens when we use a flow diverter. Yeah, there is an endothelialization across. Yeah. It's so very important a... to get uh, intima, intima. Yes, that's right. Okay, okay. Outside the uh, coil. Uh, my, my second question, Professor. Uh, uh, 
in, in endovascular procedure, how do we, uh, uh, what are the tricks and tips uh, for us to, to ensure that or to maximize the protection of a perforator, for example, in a bacillar uh, coiling or, or or including a small vessel in the anterior circulation, such as uh, superior hypophysia artery or anterior choroidal artery. I mean, those are very difficult to be seen in the angiography. So how do we make sure that we can maximally protect those vessels, Professor? Oh, it's always concern. It's a very big concern to protect mm -hmm. the uh, very small artery arising from the neck of the aneurysm, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Professor. So especially, uh, Mm, anterior choroidal artery is very small, but mm, yes. sometimes uh, arising from neck or dome of the uh, yes, yeah. artery. So at that time, we have to uh, make a very, very nice shaped uh, framing coil. Mm. For that aim, uh, I will repeat making a, a good frame, good mm -hmm. framing coil to preserve the orifice of the uh, perforator or small artery. It's very important technique, very important. You should not place the uh, coil, uh, uh, coil loop in front of the orifice of the uh, small artery or small perforators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to repeat making a good frame inside mm -hmm. the aneurysm dome. It's a very uh, important technique. Yeah. Thank you. My last uh, question. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes uh, but how about Professor? <laughs> <laughs> what is your opinion? So may I say you you showed it actually. So sometimes it may be necessary, like for the anterior coronary. You may need to keep a microcatheter in the anterior coronary to protect it. Mm -hmm. You showed it yeah. beautifully. Mm. But you can't do that for a for for instance the artery of Hubner. Hmm. Artery of Hubner, you cannot do that. So you have to be very careful, as he says, to stay within the aneurysm. And rarely, we leave a part of the aneurysm behind. Like when you clip, sometimes you, you leave, a, leave, leave, leave uh, the part of the neck behind. Similarly, when we are coiling also, you may need to leave a small part of the aneurysm around the neck behind so that you can protect that. And anterior coronary is a very important artery. You can't let it go. You can't let the artery of Yubna go. You have to be very careful with them. Okay, so Dr. Liu, uh, yes. there is another technique to preserve the perforating artery. Uh, you can use a hyper uh, compliant balloon like uh, Scepter XC, and uh, you can herniate the balloon inside, towards inside the aneurysm to uh, preserve the perforating artery okay. uh, arising around the neck. I Hyper found my, my environment is very useful. I have found, hmm? okay. found the hyperform balloon uh, molds better. So the hyperform balloon from, uh, from uh, Medtronic, that it's a very old balloon, but it is a very nice balloon for small arteries and when you want it to move, mm -hmm. bulge it to the, the bulge it to another artery. Right, right. And another way is to use atlas stent, a very large atlas stent. A loop of the uh, large atlas will hang it into the uh, dome side of the aneurysm and making some uh, space That's uh, right. That's around right. the neck, around the That's neck. Right. Mm. Right. My last question, Professor. Uh, what is your option for patients who have allergic to uh, antiplatelet, for example, aspirin? What is the option for you, uh, those cases that you need to put in a stand? History of allergic to antiplatelet, patient with allergic to antiplatelet. Antiplatelet? Yeah, allergic. 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 Yes, yes, yes. What is your option? <laughs> it's a very difficult <laughs> question. I will not treat the patient. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, may, may I answer that? Yeah, but yeah. I've never seen patient uh, who is allergic to the antiplatelet agent. Yeah. I've never seen. I've never seen. Okay. Okay. So we have some patients who are allergic to aspirin, mm -hmm. and those who have G6. But the reaction is not so large, uh, not yeah. so severe. Mm -hmm. But Maybe. there are we have we have a community called the Parsis. 
in India, mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. have, who do not have, who have a deficiency of the G6PD. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if there is a G6PD deficiency, then we do not use aspirin. In that case, mm-hmm. we have been using uh, dipyrimidine. Mm-hmm. So, so we use, you can still use uh, Plavix and you can use mm-hmm. dipyrimidine. So we have used okay. dipyrimidine, dipyrimidine in these patients. That's right. Okay. Nowadays, we have several kinds of antiplatelet agents like uh, uh, clopidogrel, uh, prasgrel, ticagrelol, or silostazole. Silostazole. Mm. Mm. I don't post- aspirin. So, so you can use that uh, uh, agent instead of aspirin. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Yes, Thomas, Tommy. Yeah, hi, Professor. So, hi, how are you? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you for your presentation. So I think that uh, for the uh, your presentation is superb. Uh, I have no questions. I need some time to digest it first before making some questions. Okay. Right. Thank you, Thomas, for joining. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more question that I would like to say is: What about intraoperative rupture? What 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 is your uh, strategy when you have an intraoperative rupture of uh, aneurysm during coiling? Intraoperative or... rupture. Yeah. So that's why I always put a balloon catheter in front of the aneurysm neck. Or balloon uh, guiding catheter will be available. And uh, at any time uh, we have uh, intraoperative rupture, I, I will inflate the balloon catheter, balloon catheter in front of the aneurysm neck. And uh, I will occlude the parent artery for five minutes. And af- after then, deflate the balloon to make sure the uh, hemostasis or not. Okay. Balloon is very useful. Balloon is very useful, like a temporary clip, temporary clip. Right. How about... Uh, may, 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 may I say something? Please. So the first thing is like you do in surgery, do not lose your cool. Don't <laughs> lose your cool. That's the first thing. Don't right, get, right. don't pull the coil out. The coil is half inside, half outside, and uh, there is a hemorrhage. You realize that there is a hemorrhage. So how do you realize there is a hemorrhage? Hmm. There is a sudden rise in the blood pressure. There is a uh, if you have injected contrast, you will see extravasation of the contrast. If you have an EBD, and I had it once, there was a gush of blood into the EBD. Okay, external ventricular. The most important thing is. <laughs> Not to get upset. Yeah, don't lose your <laughs> to get upset. That's the first thing. Leave your coil as it is, partly inside, partly outside. Continue to coil. So first thing is tell your anesthetist that you have had a rupture. Neutralize the heparin. Then we always have heparin circulating to prevent clot formation during the procedure. So we neutralize the heparin. We right. and uh, uh, we usually give blood mannitol. Pressure. Blood pressure. Yeah should be uh, decreased. You, no, but we are going to inflate the balloon, so we do not drop the blood pressure. If you do not have a blood, an annual, uh, do not have a balloon, then you have to drop the blood pressure, yes. We give mannitol, we run in mannitol 100 ml, and uh, as if you have a balloon there, inflate the balloon. If we do not have a balloon, then you have to quickly prepare a balloon, you have to move it in very quickly. So there again, we continue to coil, supposing you do not have a balloon, you continue to coil and try and work as quickly as possible to get as many coils in, inside so that you close the hole in the artery. If it mm-hmm. is a small small hole caused by the coil, it is easy. But a hole caused by the catheter is big. Then it takes much more time to close that hole. So, you, And it happens, right? it happens with everybody. It has, it has happened with me, I'm sure it has happened with most people. So your first thing is not to lose your cool. Inflate the balloon, as he said, set the trimer. Do not exceed the five minutes. If it is the big artery like the internal carotid, you can even include for 10 minutes, there's no problem. But a small artery like the M1, like the basilar, like the P- PCOM, ACOM, there you have to not more than five minutes. Deflate the balloon, let the brain breathe. Please. May, I, may I add one more yeah, please. Please. Especially for trainees, there are now simulators which are available. Mm simulator. So you can deploy a coil as you would in a patient, except that you are now doing it virtually. So many companies have these simulators 
positioned in different cities and if you ask you can go to their center training centers and play around and learn for yourself how to catheterize how to deploy a coil what happens if you perforate you can see all that when you are doing this simulation right that is a great learning experience and especially as professor kuayama showed he is a, a great supporter for acns education and uh, last time we met in phuket he was there along with uh, oshima tomataka who had this very beautiful simulators there supported by mentis mm -hmm. isn't that the company was mentis if i remember it right mentis is the company which makes the simulators yeah so we had a great learning experience from professor kuayama so i think uh, <clears throat> we will end this session we have exceeded the time so on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president professor yoko kato i would like to sincerely thank our speaker professor naoya kuayama and the chair professor ka anil karapurkar thank you very much for spending your time with us and giving us an excellent uh, lecture about coiling on cerebral aneurysms uh, thank you liu for joining uh, so until next wednesday it is bye bye from all of us thank you professor kuayama thank you professor anil karapurkar